right, welcome into Surviving Paradise. It's another week, and we are going to take another walk, warning, incoming sarcasm through the spiritual paradise of Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> welcome back. Appreciate everyone listening, tuning in, following, liking, subscribing, all great stuff. Really appreciate everybody's great comments and even better ideas for future shows and stuff that we want to tackle. It has been a week in the Jehovah's Witness world, and you undoubtedly are probably aware out there that the district convention Pursue Peace, it's funny that I even know that, is taking hold of the Jehovah's Witness world, and man, is it a doozy. Uh, we mentioned a few of the things last week. I think one of the big highlights in Stephen Lett's diatribe was calling babies enemies of God because they're born sinful. It just keeps getting worse. If you haven't seen some of the great folks and activists that are posting reviews of the district convention online, YouTube and whatnot, go take a look. These videos are so atrocious. The, the stuff for teenagers, for kids going to school, for how they handle bullying, how they handle a single mom who gets married, becomes a step parent, and how she suddenly isn't a good enough teacher because there's a man in the house now. On and on it goes. The insanity continues in this year's district convention right down to hiding in bunkers again with flashlights because the world is after Jehovah's Witnesses. It's just really incredible for those of us that have been witnesses for or were witnesses or were raised Jehovah's Witnesses for so many years. It's literally just mind numbing to watch this stuff. It's almost not recognizable. I've stated many times on this podcast that I have been out of Jehovah's Witnesses fully since February of 2009 was my last goodbye, dare you to follow me moment. And this religion has changed so dramatically. Same nonsense, same cult teachings. Nonetheless, their grip, grasp, and desired power plays for control continue on. And it, they just literally in this district convention get into every nitty gritty of a human being's life. And it is awful. It's unbelievable. And for those of us that are out of this quote unquote organization, looking at it, people we love that are still in it, it's painful. It's painful. And you, once you're free of the cognitive dissonance, you really just look in shock and terror in some cases that people that you love and care about are still a victim of this nonsense. It's unbelievable. Nonetheless, here we are. Let's take a walk through a new subject this week on surviving paradise. And this is one that I must say weighed on me heavily, continues to weigh on me heavily. I have to remind myself as an imperfect person myself that cognitive dissonance is a real thing. It's thick, it's murky, and it's deeply damaging to Jehovah's Witnesses. So I want to tackle the subject of chosen ignorance. Jehovah's Witnesses and the chosen path of ignorance. And if you were like me, and I can't imagine I'm the only person that's been asked these questions once you leave after literally it being my entire life from the time I was about three or four years old, people often ask, what was it that caused you to leave? What was the turning point? Or to extend that thought, what, what was it that shocked you the most about Jehovah's Witnesses? So I guess those are two different subjects in reality. What caused me to leave was I started studying for myself, not for the five meeting parts I had, not for the watchtower study I conducted, not for the book study I conducted, not for the public talk I was a guest speaker for. I literally started to study for myself. So when I get asked what it was that shocked me the most about Jehovah's Witnesses, this is my answer. I was a Jehovah's Witness for 40 plus years. And after 40 plus years within the organization, my answer to that question about what shocks me the most is this. The vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses know nothing. They know nothing about their religion. They know very little to nothing about their Bible. 
They know little to nothing about their own literature. They know little to nothing about the organization they are loyal to, that they professed and dedicated their life to, its history, who runs it, how it works, or anything else. Have you been asked that question? I can't imagine that I'm the only one that has been asked that. What shocks you the most about Jehovah's Witnesses? And people tend to go right down that that path of a certain doctrine that drove them nuts or a terrible experience that sent them off the rails and out or being mistreated by elders or a family member or maybe it was something tragic and horrible like blood or losing someone in death. For me, the thing that continues to shock me and yet doesn't, because now I have an understanding, but it's by far and away the biggest shocker, I guess, for lack of a better term, is that most of them don't know anything. They don't know anything about what they're a part of. And listen, I want to preface this episode by saying, I was one of those people. This isn't derogatory or making fun of others, even though we're going to have some laughs. It's part of healing. It's part of what we do here. But I was one of those people. And and the old saying that if you don't laugh, you'll cry comes into play. After 40 years, after growing up as a kid, as a teenager, just getting married and becoming a ministerial servant, pioneering, becoming an elder for 11 years, being used at the district and circuit level, I had to look in the mirror once I was no longer an elder and still somewhat associated. What do they call that now? A PIMO? I had to look in the mirror and realize, my God, for all the teaching that I'm doing because of my privilege. I don't know anything. I literally don't know anything. At a very young age, Jehovah's Witnesses, if you if they get you as a kid, as a child, and oh my goodness, this district convention has kids talking about getting baptized at eight, nine years old. Wait till you see it. If they get you at that young age, your brain and how your brain forms in terms of how you study, how you take in knowledge and how you learn is completely warped by the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. You think you know a lot and you don't know anything. And the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses know nothing. And they've chosen this bizarre path of ignorance. But as you see, it kind of falls into human nature, myself being able to speak to it because 100% guilty, this guy, this podcaster was 100% guilty. And that was as an elder, where arguably people will say you've got a lot of life and death decisions in people's hands, at least spiritually, sometimes physically. It's unbelievable how little they know and how they choose to be ignorant. So for anybody hearing this outside of Jehovah's Witnesses, another religious or spiritual person or just someone listening in that stumbled on this podcast, that, that may seem like a small thing. I mean, after all, people join organizations all the time without any knowledge of its history or its inner workings. They, you might join the Boy Scouts or a sports team or a political party, or and you don't dig and dig and dig to find out how it all got started or who was the, uh, the inventor or the person that brought it to fruition. We just, as human nature, we don't tend to do that. Not all personalities tend to do that. So this may be, ah, come on. Stacey, this is a small thing that people don't know anything about this religion. Keep in mind, however, that the important piece here is that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society claim to be home to God's one and only faithful slave here on the earth. They alone have the truth. They alone dispense it to the entire planet. They openly claim that being associated with the Watchtower Society is a matter of life and death. Folks, we we look into what we put in our mouth and our bodies more than what we would oftentimes get dedicated to in terms of religion and cult. This organization claims this is it. Life and death is in the balance. So as a human being and why we tackle this subject and why it continues to shock me, even though I have knowledge of the whys 
now, we would all naturally expect that each and every Jehovah's Witness to take the matter of being educated on their faith, the history of their religion, as well as the Bible itself, to be the paramount responsibility in their lives. It's life and death. The lives of every person on this planet, including themselves personally, including their families, including every person they pass driving at the store, go to school with, meet on the job. All of this depends on them sharing this life-giving knowledge to every single solitary, precious human being on this planet. So surely a Jehovah's Witness would know all the facts before they share this information with another precious soul, right? They would fully understand it. They would know the depth, the breadth, the detail, the nuance, the facts. They would know it all, right? Life and death. It's life and death. The Bible itself states, quoting from the New World Translation, the Bible doctored by Jehovah's Witnesses and the governing body at Romans 2.21, quote, do you, however, the one teaching someone else not teach yourself? Have they not taught themselves first? Have they not become experts on all things Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses, Watchtower and Bible and Tract Society, the Bible, their doctrines, their teachings? To emphasize the importance of this and the fact that it's taught even within their kingdom halls, the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses makes the following bold claim. This is from the Watchtower of 1962, September 1st, page 530, paragraph 22. Quote, in the New World Society of Jehovah's Witnesses, you find people from all walks of life, many of whom lack diplomas from man's centers of learning. Yet these people know the Bible. They are teachers. They accept with eagerness the obligation of teaching God's word. End quote. Watch Tower 62, September 1st, page 530, paragraph 22. They accept with eagerness being teachers. They themselves have taught themselves Everything there is to know about Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower Bible Tract Society. Folks, here's the rub. None of that is true. It couldn't be further from the truth. Not true at all. Now look, as I often tend to be emotional, go into hyperbole and whatnot, I will only say this. You can't say blanket type statements like that for every single solitary human being that is part of Jehovah's Witnesses. That would just be disingenuous and not true. There are people that study. There are people that understand this, which raises a whole bunch of other questions. Nonetheless, the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses cannot even remotely teach someone what they themselves have learned. They can't. They haven't done the study themselves. They have not, as Romans 2.21 says, taught themselves first. Am I being hard on people? No, I'm not. Approach one. Ask them a basic truth. Ask them why they don't celebrate birthdays, which we just covered last week. Ask them to explain their blood doctrine. Ask them to explain generations or overlapping generations. So after reading those comments, that quote from the Watchtower and from the Bible itself, are one of the thousands of bold claims to be God's only true organization, a person would expect that they could approach any one of the 8 million plus members in over 240 lands around the world requesting life and death information that may save their very lives. Certainly, you would probably agree, I don't think I'm, I'm stretching this or reaching here, that someone who had been a Jehovah's Witness for several decades could supply life-saving answers to any questions someone may have, right? Wrong. Wrong. And for all the great people who have stumbled upon this and are listening to this, you know that I'm telling the truth. 
You have family members, people you love, friends, former friends that you can literally pop to mind that can't answer basic questions about their dedication or their life as a Jehovah's Witness. You would expect that every person that was baptized and made a dedication to the religion or really a dedication to anything, a profession, a club, a marriage, anything, would have taken painstaking measures to know everything possible before committing their lives to that organization. They would have studied the Bible. They would know it front and back. They would at least read it once, right? I mean, read the Bible once front to back. They would look at the history of the organization, the leaders, the teachings. You'd be wrong again. You'd be wrong. They don't. The vast majority don't. Why can I make such blunt, bold, uh, potentially toxic comments, I guess? Because I was one of those people. I was one of those people, myself, personally. There was so much I didn't know and I didn't even think to know or even to look into or to contemplate or to talk about until I was faced with crisis or until the questions in my head became overwhelming. But most Jehovah's Witnesses come in and they're ignorant and they continue to choose ignorance because it's easier. We're going to talk about it. Now, to illustrate again on this matter of life and death, and the expectation that you could go to any Jehovah's Witness and get really concise, emotionally charged, correct answers to anything that you may ask them. I want to illustrate this. I, I want to hope that I got an A in the old theocratic school. I got, I got a pass on illustrations. So I'm going to use an illustration. Imagine telling people you were a doctor and you were able to save the lives of people in pain. The problem, you've never read the manual. You've never been to medical school, nor have you ever had any hands-on training as a doctor. You don't know basic truths about the anatomy of the human body. You haven't studied, been mentored, or done anything except show out front of the medical school and sit in the parking lot and listen in every now and then. Would you trust your child to such a doctor? <laughs> Would you trust yourself? It's absurd. It's stupid. And it's a silly question. Nonetheless, this illustration fits. Jehovah's Witnesses and publish a basic Jehovah's Witness publisher. They go out in field service. They hope for 10 hours a month. They're, they're knocking on strangers' doors, telling them they're right. The guy behind the door is wrong. A Jehovah's Witness publisher claims to have life-giving knowledge to share to all. But this all depends on them taking in knowledge themselves. And as argumentative and as controversial as this next comment is, it's true. Most Jehovah's Witnesses live under two umbrellas. They're entirely too fearful and they're entirely too lazy to research anything for themselves. I'm going to say it again, and I know it's going to ruffle feathers, but most are too fearful or too lazy. They've been associated with it. They can't answer basic questions. They've shown up to the medical school college and sat, college and sat in the parking lot for decades oftentimes, and they can't tell you what causes the common cold. They can't tell you why you should take your temperature. Yet they continue to profess that they have life-saving knowledge for the planet without themselves having taught themselves personally anything about this organization. Many have never read the Bible. Many, and I mean many, don't read the literature at all. They get a new book, it goes on the shelf. They get the new magazine, it goes in the, in the book bag. Most don't even prepare for field service. Come on now. I'm being blunt, and I know that that's probably going to piss some people off, but that's the truth. And I think most people that have been Jehovah's Witnesses or associated with them for any amount of time know that I'm speaking the truth. Most of them are grossly ignorant and they choose it. Now to say that's ironic is an understatement. If you look, and again, my platform and where my experiences live are in the United States. 
in the Western world, more developed countries. Okay, this isn't to speak to developing countries or some of those that live below the poverty line where Jehovah's Witnesses are out preaching. They, it's unbelievable the things those amazing people do. But out West, in a world where everything is available to you, Jehovah's Witnesses in, in a common congregation of 100, 120 people, which is dwindling rapidly, as we are finding out, most of them wouldn't dream of missing their favorite TV show. No way. No way. They've got their nights locked in on the flat screen. Or, or they wouldn't dream of missing time in their hobby. Out, out west here, a lot of guys golf. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people go camping. They do a lot of outdoorsy type stuff. Wouldn't miss that for anything. They can tell you all sorts of details around that. But those same people will go their entire lives serving this organization or claiming to serve it without ever putting in the effort to know the organization's history, its basic doctrines, or anything having to do with its leadership. The governing body was really pitched, and of course now the faithful slave, New Light, if you're just now finding that out. The eight guys in upstate New York, most of that came into real uh pitch perfect existence. They really started pushing it and pitching it in 71, 72. Prior to that, as a kid, and even up through the 80s, none of us even knew who was on the governing body. We didn't know who those people are. Now they're rock stars. They got a TV studio and you get to see them, all their personalities, uh, Stephen Lett, Tony Morris, good grief. All of them are come right into your homes now on the TV screen or on the computer, but we didn't know who they were. And for decades, people didn't even look into it. Who are these guys? Nobody knows. Nobody even knows their names, unless you worked at Bethel in Brooklyn at the time, now in upstate. The people would go decades without knowing any of this and dedicate their life to it. They put more effort into scheduling, you know, the DVR, if you will. Yeah, I'm showing my age to tape their favorite sitcom than they would to read the Bible reading that week. Come on now, as controversial and as nasty as this may sound, it, it's true. It's true. Some of those same people will give up some of life's greatest joys. They, they won't have children. They won't go to college, this guy included. They wouldn't celebrate holidays, this guy included. But many of them do it, do it and obey without any understanding as to why. They literally can't tell you why. Birthdays is a perfect example of this, as I've stated. Instead, they just lean into the same canned responses they've heard over and over and over again, oftentimes since they were children, at least for my generation. A, a canned response like, the society says so, or the governing body told me, or I heard it at the kingdom hall my whole life. They can't back it up. You can't approach them and ask them to teach you. They don't know. They've never taught themselves. And I think the part that was so shocking to me, and, and when people ask me this, they sense my emotion. That, and I, I'm guessing, and I would love to hear everybody's comments on what it was that shocked them the most or what they continue to struggle with looking back once they leave. For me, it was the fact that they would choose this. I chose it. I'm throwing myself under the bus. I chose to be ignorant. People seem to think it's okay to choose ignorance, but it's not. It's very easy to see that choosing ignorance isn't innocence. It's actually sinful. There's nothing about the Bible or even Jehovah's Witnesses in what is one of the most ridiculous campaigns to educate yourself and study, but only our way. It's not difficult to see that to choose to be ignorant, to choose to just go with the crowd, to choose to not understand it, is actually a sin. It's a sin. There's a famous quote by Robert Browning that makes this point, that choosing ignorance is an innocence, it's a sin. Especially in an era today where we have so much at our fingertips. Information is so readily accessible. And I've said it many times, and I want to mark this, and I want to emphasize it, 
that for Jehovah's Witnesses, you don't need apostates. You don't need apostate websites. You don't need apostate YouTubes or podcasts or literature. Just study your own stuff. The lights come on. Read the Bible front to back. Do it twice. I mean, imagine that. It's supposed to be the manual from Jehovah, a letter personally to you. It outlines all the instructions. It is life and death. And most Jehovah's Witnesses have never read it. They've never read it. Folks, it's tantamount to Jesus showing up at your local circuit assembly hall for a special meeting telling you everything you need to know about life and you deciding not to attend. Eh, who needs that? I don't need to see Jesus in person or hear what he has to say. But Jehovah's Witnesses will do it their whole life. People I love have never read the Bible front to back or even studied it. They've chosen ignorance. They've chosen to just completely listen to whatever they're told. Thomas Edison makes this point about human nature so well. He says, quote, 5% of the people think, 10% of the people think they think, and the other 85% would rather die than think, end quote. And it's true. We're all guilty of it, this guy included. We can easily be swept up in a wave of what somebody says on stage at the Kingdom Hall, or it's everything I've ever known, or it's all I've ever known. But then you begin to look in the mirror and realize you've never really known. You've just taken everybody's word for it. So while I was shocked at the lack of knowledge among my fellow worshipers, particularly as I started to exit, including myself, throwing myself under this bus, I was even more shocked by the gross lack of effort to obtain knowledge and truth. This became especially true to me once I left Jehovah's Witnesses. And for my journey, it was about looking at myself, not anyone else. Despite being told they hold the key to saving humanity, to saving babies, to saving children, to the promise of eternal life, to the end of misery, Jehovah's Witnesses, vast majority of them embrace a path of chosen ignorance. They choose to not know. They choose to not look. It's comfortable. It's human nature. So despite all the proof being at their fingertips, it's on their bookshelves. It, back in the day, it was on the CD-ROM. It's literally now on their website, although they buried a lot of the old stuff because it is so damning and proves exactly what they are. But you, many still have access to the hard copies. They got the books. They got the old bound volumes. They've got this stuff. Despite having that, Jehovah's Witnesses considered both strong, somebody could be an elder, this guy, and weak, can just be associated for decades and decades, won't seek the truth. They won't do it. They choose to bury their heads in the sand, despite the fact that they're very claiming that their very lives depend on knowing the truth. It would be very reasonable to expect that once you have brought some of these painful facts regarding the religion's history or the gross disobedience or ignorance surrounding Bible principles to their attention, that they would, they would go full Josiah mode. You remember the story where he discovered the scrolls in the temple and he ripped his clothes off of his body in grief and misery, tearing his clothes apart when he realized he wasn't being obedient or that he hadn't read what Jehovah wanted him to read. So that may be a little dramatic. It may be dramatic because most Jehovah's Witnesses, when they stumble upon this, slide into misery, depression, emotion, pain, any endless stuff. But you would suspect that anybody that was so dedicated to God would run home and make every effort to unearth the truth. Their lives depend on it. Their children's lives depend on it. Their wife, their husband, their mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. They would look to unearth the truth, to get to the bottom of things, to study, to do whatever it takes to find out the truth of the matter. 
But I am here to tell you, shockingly, most do not. It's just easier not to. It's easier to take to continue on in their current life, to ignore the facts and continue blindly following something that is obviously wrong. How do you even begin to pull over overlapping generations on people unless they're drowning in this chosen path of ignorance, which by extension, we know now, once you're free of it or aware of it, that in reality, much of it is cognitive dissonance subconsciously so many know so many know folks in their hearts their minds it's why they don't put out maximum effort it's why they don't follow all the rules to perfection it's why they have that second third fourth drink after the meeting thursday nights they know cognitive dissonance is tricky it's murky it's dirty it's dark why can i say that because myself for decades of my life I too accepted just what I heard at the Kingdom Hall. I just accepted it. I I hear it from the stage. I'd look at the verse used to back it up. They have a very succinct way with their propaganda, the way they penetrate your brain and the way you think. I whatever was passed on to me by a fellow worshiper, by an elder, by someone I respected. It really for me personally, and this is where that question comes in with people, like, what was it that made you just what shocks you today? It wasn't really until I was a congregation elder that I began to wonder why we so blatantly disobeyed the basics, the basic, easy stuff of Christ's example. There, there were many times, full confession mode here, that I wished I could be like my peers. I could just stick my head in the sand and just keep moving on. Do the Christianity a la carte, pick the good, leave the stuff I didn't want to talk about. But I'm just not built that way. I couldn't do it. It eventually caught up with me. For me, one of the biggest, and it sounds so simplistic as you learn it as a kid, for me, the whole experience as a Jehovah's Witness and the whole ocean of hypocrisy, of badness, of damnation, of, of how it damages human people can be found in the illustration of the Good Samaritan. If you can read that over and over again and come to the conclusion that Jehovah's Witnesses are doing it right, you are a victim. You are a hundred feet deep in an ocean of cognitive dissonance because it's all right there. So it was when I was a congregation elder that I really began to go, what? We ignore basic stuff. For many years, I dismissed the fact that so many I shared worship with truly had zero knowledge of what they believed in. And I mean people I loved people in my family to this hour. I even learned to dismiss it in my fellow congregation elders, telling myself, well, look, they were chosen by Holy Spirit, God magic. These men just weren't student types. They weren't studious, but they had other gifts to offer. They were good in other ways. Keep in mind, though, and the part I couldn't dismiss, that men that serve as elders literally deal with life and death matters at times. Things like blood transfusions, things like child abuse. I know of one elder that dealt with murder. And if you don't want to take it to the physical extreme in, in modern times, how about the fact that they're dealing with people's spiritual eternity and then you learn that they've never read the Bible and don't study their own literature? This guy included, and I was a student type. There was still stuff I never dug into. And, and to see and know that many of those you're serving with on a body of elders have never, they could never quote basic Bible scriptures, much less counsel someone with life-altering problems, damage and problems. To this day, many of those that I love dearly continue to put no effort into fully understanding a religion they've dedicated their lives to. Unknowingly, and that in itself is so ironic, Jehovah's Witnesses stand up at a circuit or district assembly, and they pledge allegiance to an organization. Not God, not knowledge, not Jesus or his example. And I'm going to prove it right now. They're required to answer yes audibly to the entire, entire auditorium. I've given this talk at the circuit level to the following question before they dedicate their lives and are immersed in baptism. And this may have changed, so bear with me. This question is pulled from the Watchtower 1985, June 1st, page 30. Quote, 
Here's the question that you are standing in front of all onlookers, typical circuit assembly, eh, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 people. And the brother giving the talk, this guy did it, asked this question. He says, quote, do you understand that your dedication and baptism identify you as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in association with God's spirit-directed organization? They would then yell, yes. Having answered yes to these questions, candidates are in a right heart condition to undergo Christian baptism, end quote. You'll note first that that question is not found anywhere in the Bible. <laughs> no one asked it, including Jesus, even John the Baptist. Isn't it bizarre? Decides to baptize the Son of God and, hey, he didn't ask him that question about this spirit-anointed organization thing. Never mind. Jesus now runs it from the heavens with eight guys in upstate New York. Right, right. Sure he does. But even more damning is that nearly every person answering yes to this question, often in front of a thousand people or better, sometimes at the district convention, six, seven, eight thousand. When they answer that question, they know almost nothing about Jehovah's Witnesses. Most of them know absolutely nothing about Jehovah's Witnesses. They've gone through the questions in a book with two or three elders, basic questions so that they can literally parrot back anything that's been read, said, or done in the Watchtower magazine. That's the best that can be done or out of their publications. Basic questions like, do you know not to celebrate birthdays? Do you know not to take blood? Very basic stuff. I, I guarantee you there's no questions about, please explain to me and the elders uh, as a whole uh, overlapping generations or tell us who the first president of the watchtowers they don't know any of that it's absurd they don't they run through questions of basic doctrinal things that any person almost on the street that's ever heard of jehovah's witnesses can answer but the depth the depth of knowledge no it's not there it's not there in the vast majority People who have been baptized witnesses for decades are literally stumped if you ask them basic questions about their organization. These are people I love. I've done this. The same is true if you ask them questions about the Bible or doctrines of the governing body, or if you ask them anything about Watchtower history. They don't know. They'll sing songs from their Kingdom Melody songbook at meetings, songs with lyrics that talk about living or dying for their faith without ever knowing what their faith includes. So the, the question here after beating that to death, because as you can tell, it's one of those things that really drives me nuts. And I think if I'm being really candid, even about myself, that I was duped, that I was silly, that I got sucked into cognitive dissonance, that I didn't spend more time building it up in myself, teaching myself. But it's one of those things that drives me insane. So the question is, why do good people with an honest desire to know and please God, the Almighty, fall into a path of chosen ignorance? Why did they do that? This is something that Jehovah's Witnesses and the governing body have mastered. They've mastered this. And it's nothing new. It's the same propaganda. It's the same stuff you will see in any cult or religion. It comes with two big ingredients and you dump them all into a pot and you stir. And those two ingredients are laziness and fear. They're the perfect recipe, the perfect formula for what we now see in Jehovah's Witnesses and this chosen path of ignorance. And let's be honest with ourselves right here and now. Ignorance feels a lot better than fear, does it not? Being ignorant feels a lot better. It's a lot less uncomfortable than fear. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society feeds its members a very steady dose of fear. To question, to even now, and we know because if you're listening to this, you're a PIMO or you're an ex-Jehovah's Witness or you're an apostate, any given title or you're mentally diseased, as they call this, to question the faithful and discreet slave recently changed to just be the gate guys in upstate New York, the governing body, is a one-way ticket out of the organization and a lifetime of shunning from everyone you love or everyone you know. Any person who actually makes an effort to think 
and to question something from the organization is in the very least labeled weak, they're marked, or at the worst, as I mentioned, we're suddenly labeled as an apostate. We're on the outside. We're evil. We're doomed to destruction, a fireball, an earthquake crevasse has our name on it. We see the pictures. You've seen the illustrations. In recent issues of the Watchtower, the governing body has labeled all those that question their teachings or authority as mentally diseased. A label that even, for those of us that have been around a while, even drew attention from the media, even British law enforcement, Australia, who began to investigate the organization for promoting hate crimes. That's how bad it got. To give a reader an idea of how an apostate or someone who does not choose ignorance is seen, look no further than the Watchtower magazine. Watchtower, November 15th, 2013, page 20. Quote, all of us must be ready to obey any instructions we may receive, whether these appear sound from a strategic or human standpoint or not. End quote. Anything outside that command, it doesn't have to appear sound. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to be logical. It doesn't have to lead to your safety. It doesn't have to be for your well-being. It doesn't matter. If you don't obey the governing body and you don't choose ignorance and you don't obey with a mind and thought press process dripping in ignorance, don't question us. Don't ask me to explain it. Don't go looking. Don't study you're going to be an apostate. It's one of the most famous quotes that November 15th, 2013, that shows the level of cognitive dissonance. And let's call it what it is. It's damn evil. Particularly when you consider the children who are just developing critical thinking are going, wait a minute. And it starts so young. I've exposed myself on this podcast where you know, Noah's Ark, I, I'm looking at the Bible stories book in 1978 and God's drowning babies and puppies. Why is that? They can't even read, mom. <laughs> Don't you dare allow that de- that thinking to develop. According to the Watchtower, November 15, 2013, it doesn't have to appear sound. It doesn't have to appear logical or safe. Let's take it further. Watchtower, November 1st, 1993, page 19, quote, True Christians share Jehovah's feelings towards such apostates, those that don't choose ignorance. They are not curious about apostate ideas. On the contrary, they feel a loathing towards those who have made themselves God's enemies. But they leave it to Jehovah to execute vengeance. End quote. August 18th, 2011, from examining the scriptures daily, the daily text, quote, Satan was the first creature to turn apostate. We talked about those demon guys last week. Modern day apostates display characteristics similar to those of the devil. Their mind may be poisoned by a critical attitude toward individuals in the congregations, Christian elders, or the governing body. Some apostates oppose the use of the divine name, Jehovah. They're not interested in learning about Jehovah or in serving him. Like their father, Satan, apostates target people of integrity, period, end quote. Examining the scriptures daily, August 18th, 2011. We're from Satan because we don't just accept things at face value from the stage anymore. We recognize something's off. We choose not to be ignorant. You're from Satan. You are to obey us whether it makes a damn bit of sense or not. To even question the writers of the Watchtower magazine makes you a son of Satan. So the effect of such nonstop fear-mongering is millions of people who wouldn't dare allow themselves to think or do research or to critically question whether a matter or new doctrine is true. This alone shows that choosing a path of ignorance on any comment regarding God, His Word, Jehovah's Witnesses, the governing body, or any organization supported or touching Jehovah's Witnesses is an act of disobedience. They are pushing people to choose ignorance. Choosing ignorance based on fear isn't acceptable according to the Bible. This is 100% from the governing body. The Bible says this, 1 John 4, 1, quote, and I love this scripture if I'm being honest. Beloved ones, do not believe every inspired statement 
but test the inspired statements to see whether they originate with God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. End quote, 1 John 4, 1. But with Jehovah's Witnesses, ignorance is entirely more comfortable than the fear of shunning, of losing everyone you love, everyone you love, being disfellowshipped, shunned, called names, called mentally diseased. And that alone causes many Jehovah's Witnesses to choose ignorance, to stick their head in the sand. You heard it. The 2013 quote, you're not to question us. You're not to ask if it makes sense. You are to obey. Shut your mouth, shut your ears, shut your eyes, shut your brain down and obey. Cardinal D. Rates, the famous quote where he says, quote, nothing sways the stupid more than arguments they can't understand. And that's where the second part of this recipe that leads to chosen ignorance comes from. Many outsiders would understand, if you're listening to this and those of us that have left or are thinking about leaving or are contemplating it, we understand how fear affects us. We still live with it. Most of those that leave Jehovah's Witnesses, this guy included, still have scars. There's PTSD. There's religious trauma. There's emotions, pain. I see it in the comments on YouTube, on Twitter. You see it. But it's much more difficult to understand how a person could fall victim to the second part of this recipe, which is laziness. And you might say, God, that isn't fair, Stacy. Just based on what we just talked about, that isn't fair. And eh, I kind of tend to agree with you. But there's not a better word. Maybe complacency, maybe complacency, but I'm going to use laziness because it's harsh. Laziness is kind of part of human nature. It has no place in matters of life or death, right? We're not going to be lazy in an emergency. We're not going to be lazy with life and death. Thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses have refused blood transfusions or clung to matters of neutrality in politics. See the Holocaust. Jehovah's Witnesses were widely persecuted and killed in concentration camps. And it's led to their deaths. Every witness would tell you that their faith is the most important part of their life. Nothing, nothing is more important than being a loyal Jehovah's Witness. Doing it right. Being faithful to Jehovah and to, as we've seen, a commitment to the organization. However, this isn't popping off. This isn't making fun of people, even though I have to laugh. That's how I deal with it. Most Jehovah's Witnesses will spend more time recording their TV shows or going camping than studying their faith. They'll spend more time watching YouTubes or playing video games if they're a kid. They simply wrap themselves in the security blanket of weekly meetings in order to feel educated, in order to feel like they're being faithful. It's not an accident. It's a formula that works from the governing body. These meetings include watchtower literature with predetermined questions that each person in the audience underlines and parrots the answer back to the person on stage. You can call it what you will, folks, but at the end of the day, it's brainwashing. It's, in my day, three meetings a week, and if you're an elder or servant or a pioneer, you're studying and preparing even more. Your brain is under constant barrage and pounding of thinking and debating and reasoning the way they want you to. And if people just show up to the meetings, they feel like they're doing enough. People I love still do it, folks. People I love. Very few, very few put out any more effort than what I just described. You would be shocked to learn that the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses have never read the Bible cover to cover. Yet they claim that every decision they make in life is based on its contents. They hold fast to the belief that the Watchtower Society is chosen by God himself, yet they rarely read their own publications, letters from Jesus. <laughs> the governing body will tell you they're doing it in the current district convention that Jesus runs this thing. We don't. This is all from Jesus. Yet they won't take anything away and read it, study it critically think about it, cross-reference it. Their life depends on it. If you're a diabetic, you got to have insulin. You got to change your diet. 
and you will because your life depends on it, but your spiritual life living forever in a paradise earth? Nope. No. You can see why this subject fires me up and why people say, what's the most shocking thing? This is it. This is it. Most publishers can't explain any of their beliefs. They can't speak to any of the organization's history. They don't even have an understanding of foundational doctrinal teaching. And if I was going to point at an example immediately, nowhere is this more evident than in a somewhat recent change to their foundation doctrine on generations. This needs its own show because it's so laughably bad. For decades, Jehovah's Witnesses have gone to millions of people's doors, millions all over the globe, to tell them that the generation that saw 1914 or had an understanding of it, and they do all sorts of mental gymnastics to say that might be a 10-year-old. I'm not going to get into that here. But the generation that saw 1914 would not pass away before the world came to an end. Their message was, become a Jehovah's Witness or die. Make no bones about it. They put frosting on it and lots of pretty pictures of panda bears, but that's the message. Join us or you're dead at Armageddon. You may have noted now that it is now 2022. And that generation is in fact well over 100 years old. No, let's be serious. They're dead. <laughs> They're gone. But shockingly, Millions of Jehovah's, this was on millions of pages. Entire generations of people grew up believing this, preaching it, going to people's doors and teaching them old light. These people made decisions based on this that was wrong. They made the right decision, not getting involved. But shockingly, millions of Jehovah's Witnesses now accept the governing body's explanation that Jesus just meant overlapping generations. Aside from the absurdity of that message, as well as millions of people just accepting it, very few Jehovah's Witnesses will put any effort into studying it. Those that do come away and have to say prayers because they know it's a pile of BS. Even more ironic is the fact that many within the religion can't explain the basics of the original doctrine surrounding 1914 that they themselves went and tried to tell other people about a teaching that has changed six times. <laughs> six times. So walk up to a Jehovah's Witness today and ask them, teach me a job about generations. Their first answer should be, which one? There's been six of them. I mean, that Jesus is one confused guy up there, apparently. He wants the world just drowning in chaos on this issue of how to live forever. But the common witness can't explain any one of those six times, and they sure as hell try it. Don't take my word for it. Can't explain overlapping generations because no one can. It sounds like something out of Star Trek. So while this recent change caused some to raise their eyebrows, some of the old timers, those of us have been around, those same people make no effort to look into the long history of failure this organization has been preaching. Even if mentioned to them, you likely get this kind of a response. Yeah, I need to look that up. Yeah, I should look that up. Thanks for it. Yeah, I need to study that. Keep in mind, again, this is something they claim means life or death for them, their families, their kids, everybody around them, everything they love. They'll then walk away from that conversation and forget the entire thing. They'll never go study it. They go right back into the cave of cognitive dissonance. They choose the path of ignorance. It's incredible. It's incredible to me. But what are the implications of caving to fear, of caving to laziness? The two recipes in the pot that have them down this path of being ignorant. Little do they realize that just from a spiritual standpoint, they're committing sin. The Bible doesn't teach it it's okay to be ignorant. It doesn't teach it's okay to follow men. We know that. There's a quote from Clement Stone that says, quote, truth will always be truth, regardless of the lack of understanding, disbelief, or ignorance, end quote. So despite caving into fear and laziness, a Jehovah's Witness cannot change the truth. 
you'll often hear a witness saying the light gets brighter or we're making adjustments or things are being refined as if truth somehow changes and morphs and evolves into something else. Truth doesn't change because you want it to or you need it to. It's truth. It's an absolute. Gravity exists. You can claim it doesn't. Go jump off your roof and see what happens. <laughs> truth is truth. It doesn't evolve or change. Now, the Watchtower Society and the governing body have consistently failed. They failed over and over again in their predictions since the late 1800s. Go look at it, Jehovah's Witnesses, if you're brave enough to still be listening. You don't need apostates. Read your own literature. It's all there. Coupled with their ever-changing doctrines on everything from blood to college to who the faithful slave is, now it's the governing body, big shock, you have a long line of proof that they are no different than any other religion or cult. Clearly, they continue to use the tools of confusion and the heavy hand of authority to keep every Jehovah's Witness in line, and man, are they going after kids because that's where their growth starts. Get them young, mold those brains, warp them. The fact that millions of people would rather be associated with them despite understanding, disbelief, or ignoring the facts isn't going to change the truth. And the truth is this. They're just men. They're just a bunch of guys abusing power and using it under the umbrella of God, of religion. They employ the same fear tactics to control people. They lean into the human nature to be lazy and take it easy. It's the same old formula. It's been working forever. P.T. Barnum said there's one born every minute. The Wizard of Oz says pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I could use 400 other examples of how they lean into human nature and get them to obey something that is absurd. And here's what makes me angry. People die. People die for this without ever understanding it. Children are abused, warped, harmed for life. Some of the people listening, we've all been there. We're all scarred in one way or another, but they're still doing this. So for those that continue to hold the Bible dear, you will find that choosing ignorance is not choosing innocence. It's not the same. It's like looking the other way when you hear a woman screaming for help. We each have a responsibility, first and foremost to ourselves, but certainly to those that we love, that we take care of. We can't just look the other way. Ignorance is an innocence. To ignore the facts is in itself an attitude. It's a sin. There's compassion there because we've been taught this. We've been beat up by an organization that molds people's brains. However, the most significant sign that should drive a Jehovah's Witness or a PIMO or, or anybody that's contemplating this to really reevaluate any of this is to just look at yourself and evaluate your happiness. The Watchtower Society, the governing body, continues to brainwash from the stage and in the millions of pages of literature. They say openly, Watchtower, March 1st, 1989, page 3, quote, In fact, as a group, they are the most privileged, the most successful, and by far the happiest group on earth today, as you will see in the next article, end quote. Aside from the absurdity and the arrogance of such a ridiculous statement, like, is there some kind of meter? And this start leans into things like Scientology, where they have these little machines you put your hands on. How do you measure who the happiest people on earth are? You take a, do you draw blood? How does this even work? It's nuanced. You can't measure happiness per se. You certainly can't claim you're the most happy, but they do. They plant the seed. Aside from such an ignorant statement, it isn't true. If ignorance is truly bliss, it isn't evident among Jehovah's Witnesses. It isn't. In fact, there's just as many problems, just as many challenges. There's just as much pain among Jehovah's Witnesses as any other organization. In most cases, most of us would probably agree there's more. There's more pain and unhappiness because you are truly drowning in a sea of nonsense. 
there's really no other better way to say it. I mentioned the quote at the outset, Robert Browning, where he said, quote, ignorance is not innocence, but sin, end quote. So when I get asked this question, I get fired up, as is obvious, and I pop off on a microphone, and I hope that anybody that might be on the fence that's listening maybe goes away and contemplates some of this. It's my sincere hope that the most and many, the, the many really honest hearted, kind people among Jehovah's Witnesses, there are a lot of them, will someday crash through these barriers of fear, of laziness or complacency to discover the truth about this organization. In the meantime, if you're listening, be assured that there are many of us who were once just as dedicated, just as complacent, just as fearful to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and the governing body that have freed ourselves. And we freed ourselves because we knew we were on this path of chosen ignorance and we chose to get off it. You don't get hurt. There's the man behind the curtain. There's a lot of stuff they don't want you to see. And as I've stated many times, one message to anyone who's on the fence or that may came in contact with this little podcast effort, please, you don't need to go out and read a bunch of books or go to apostate websites or any of that. By the way, 99.9% .9 of them are kind and compassionate to anyone reading. No, all you have to do is read your own stuff. Dig into the library. Have a few questions. Take notes. Listen in. Do some history. No one's going to get hurt. You can do this in private. But whatever you do, whatever you do, please, please, please don't be among those people that I have alluded to here. Don't choose the path of ignorance. Time. You can't get it back. Get off that path. All right, there it is. There it is. <laughs> the question is, what is it, Stacy, that always shocks you? This is the one. The power of fear, laziness, and complacency to put us all into that deep end of the pool of cognitive dissonance that keeps us on that chosen path of ignorance. So please, if you're Jehovah's Witness or someone just listening or many of the great people to comment and take the time to listen to this hour-long diatribe, thank you. I appreciate it. Please, please give this some consideration. Get off that path. Get off it. There's so much more out there for you to learn and do. I want to hear from you. Thank you again to all the folks who take the time to listen and comment. Please give me your thoughts. Sorry for the technical difficulties right in the middle of this episode. Hopefully I can clean those up. But I want to hear from you. What is it that shocks you the most about Jehovah's Witnesses? It doesn't have to have anything to do with mine. I'd love to hear in the comments on YouTube, Twitter, from those that are taking the time, what is it that shocks you most about Jehovah's Witnesses right now or in your own experience with Jehovah's Witnesses? I want to thank you guys again for joining me. I really appreciate you joining me on this passion project. I hope it's helping at least one person out there. That's my only goal, at least one. But God, would it be a blessing if it was a lot more, especially young people. Thanks for joining me on our little trip through the woods here, through Surviving Paradise. I appreciate it all, and I will see you all next week. Thanks again.